And good evening, all. Professor Jennifer Harrison Harrower back with you again. This is your week seven concept. Hopefully, everyone had a restful weekend after the exam. Let's get started. Sharing my screen. Chapter five. talk about economics of the U.S. healthcare delivery. Very important to, to understand as a future nurse. A listed here for you guys. We're going to identify the factors uh, influencing national healthcare spending, um, public health and economic principles to nursing and uh, health care, what is the role of the government in all this and third party payers and public care, care financing? We're going to delve a little bit deeper into those as well. Im implications of health care rationing from an economic perspective, levels of prevention as they relate to public health economics. Well, so we're talking about dollars here. How are those monies allocated for the health care of the population? So let's get started with healthcare disparities. We've likely heard of this term before, but what does it actually, what does it mean and how does it relate to, to economics and all that? Well, healthcare disparities are differences among population groups in the var variability, accessibility, and quality of healthcare services aimed at prevention, treatment, and management of diseases and their complications, including screening tests, diagnostic treatment, management, and rehabilitation services. You've heard about the Affordable Health Care Act and the Prevention and Public Health Fund. These are all different programs and places to help try to address those health care disparities amongst different ethnicities, racial groups, um, and what have you. Knowledge about health economics is particularly important to nurses. So public health nurses and, and those community health nurses, they they definitely care about the economics because they they are looking at the health care of the community. So they see all of this and they see the different disparities when they're out in the field working. They are the ones who are often in a position to to if you will, allocation of resources to solve a problem or to design a plan, to coordinate with leaders, evaluate community-based health services and programs. They're really good at, at, at what they do. So there is a link between poverty and poor health outcomes when we're getting back into talking about disparities. And the consequences are often tied to lack of health insurance for these individuals. In the United States, they spend we spend so much more on health care than other countries um, of equal caliber, if you will. The cost of care has been rising more and more and more uh, than the rate of inflation since the mid-1960s. So we've been dealing with the rise of health care costs for a long, 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 long time. So having a knowledge about health care economics is important to our community health nurses. And so thinking about public health and economics, let's just go over a few definitions. So when you think about economics, think about the, the science concerned with the use of resources, including how is it produced? How is that resource distributed? How is it consumed? What types of goods and services are, are utilized? Health economics is concerned with how the scarcity of resources affects health care. Um, so the lack of resources uh, and how that impacts health care industry. Economics focuses on the production, the distribution, the consuming of goods and services as related to public health and where limited public resources might best be 
allocated to save lives for the greater good and increase the quality of life for the population. So a lot of this is just memorizing the terms economics, health economics, public health economics, and the like. So the four principles that are suggested that explain how public health financing may occur is the source and use of money controlled by solely by the government. Then you look at government controls of the money, but the private sector controls how the money is used. And then the private sector controls the money, but the government controls how the money is used. And the private sector controls the money and how it's used. So it's just a little bit of um, just realizing the principles associated with that. And it, it's outlined in your text to support population-focused prevention health services. That's what public health finance is about, using that money in a population-focused, not individual-focused prevention um, efforts, if you will. And so when the government provides funding, money, and controls the use, the monies come from the taxpayers, user fees such as license fees, purchase of alcohol and cigarettes, all of those fees go into, um, go into government funding and how they use the money for health care. They can use these money to allocate it for the use of health care. So factors affecting resource allocation in health care are listed here for you. The uninsured, poor Americans, those vulnerable folks who have uh, an access, a lack of access to health care, those on Medicaid and safety net providers and the Affordable Health Care Act, and rationing that health care through health benefit exchanges. So when you're looking at primary prevention, as far as these efforts concerned, you're looking at behavior and lifestyles have been shown to greatly impact the longevity of with the environment, biological accounting for the greatest effect development on illness. Higher value should be placed on primary prevention. And that goes without saying. Primary prevention, remember that's our education focus, that the first tier before we even get to the second day or ter tertiary, we wanna prevent at the primary level as much as possible and focus on those efforts. So one of the four major factors that affect health, again, we're talking about there, are the um, social, economic, and human biology. Um, this are said to have the least effect. So focus on the behavioral and those lifestyles. And the unit, U.S. Prevention Task Force, their recommendations for primary care practice um, for clinicians in primary care outlines use of regular screenings, risk factors for to identify at various stages. So that's going to be your secondary prevention there. People 2030 um, goals, examples of strategies to provide better access for all people, talks about the different levels of prevention. And remember, primary is the one we, we really want to harp and, and focus on. And then um, the context of the U.S. healthcare system, you know, the U.S. healthcare system, you know, developed slowly over several phases, starting in the 1700s. Um, it's listed there, the different phase, first phase, second, third, and fourth. It's just a matter of understanding that it evolved over time. And so the challenges that we now face in, in the 21st century differed from when we first started in the 1700s as far as um, healthcare challenges, is those communicable, and communicable and infectious diseases are rearing their head. Acts on terrorism, chronic diseases, uh, labor force changes are the issues that we're, we're facing these days. So in healthcare, given that economics and healthcare economics are concerned with resource use and how to to come up with the decisions to um, allocate the monies for healthcare spending. So past spending reflects um, past decisions, uh, the values and beliefs held by society, and it changes over time. The largest portion of healthcare expenses were, were for hospital care and physician services as of 2018. 
And then demographics affecting health care is the aging, our aging population, life expectancy, ethnicity, and health disparities. You know, financing of health care, you've got your public support, your public health, your um, other type of public support, and private support. And it's listed there for you, and it's in your chapters. Your public support, support if you were to name something, that would be Medicare, Medicaid, public health, TRICARE for veterans, affordable health care, and the like. There's several methods that have been used by public and private sources to pay healthcare services, and it's listed there for you. We, we, you need a standard of how economics and healthcare, how it flows, how it works. So as nurses, we must plan for future changes. Healthcare is ever changing. The financing of healthcare is ever changing. Be aware of cost of nursing services. Be aware of um, the different aspects of care where cost savings can be cost savings can be achieved always looking for ways to get things done efficiently and and cost effective as possible we um, must continue to focus as nurses on improving the overall health of the nation and therefore the values of nursing care and ensuring ensuring the economics are there to help us get things done so we must be effective as nurses in changes in the healthcare system. We have to be leaders and be involved in the delivery of providing the best possible, effective, high-quality care with the monies that we have available to us. So you are considered nurse leaders, and that is your chapter five. We're just going to continue on to our chapter 11. Let's get into infectious disease prevention and control. Let me just get to, all right, excellent. All right, infectious. We already said that. The object, objectives are listed here for you, the same objectives that are listed in the beginning of your chapter 11 that will hopefully get covered for you today. When we're talking about infectious disease, it is a complex topic, yes, and includes a study of a wide range and variety of different organisms and the pathology of them and the causes and the diagnosis and the treatment and the prevention and control, the topic requires a, an understanding of infectious disease as we approach it in the United States and the reappearance of such things such as measles, which in the recent past has contributed to, was attributed to children traveling to different countries where the vaccination rate is not as high as in the United States. So you need to be aware that in this, in our country, um, we we have a vaccination table schedule um, that children receive, and so traveling to other countries, they have everyone has different standards. So just be aware of that. And not all infectious diseases are directly transferred from person to person. The term infectious disease and community are used interchangeably throughout this chapter. So just um, we'll explain that a little bit further, you guys. Uh, historical and current perspectives are discussed here for you about the 1900s. The leading cause, most people died of infectious disease in the turn of the century. Um, and by the year 20, the 20, 2000, we improved our nutrition and sanitation. We've had vaccines and antibiotics that weren't available back in the 1900s. They used to ravage entire villages and the like. We're living longer. The so chronic diseases have been chronic diseases have replaced our infectious as far as the leading cause of death. People are dying from the, you know, the Spanish flu, but diabetes may take them out. And so going, remembering that epi triangle that we talked about, your agent, your host, and your environment, remember that. Going into modes of transmission, you have vertical transmission, 
horizontal common and vectors. These are the different types of modes that you need to be aware of, of how things are, the, the way they are transmitted to one person to another. And then the development, there's an incubation period of time where the each there's different times where it well, it incubates before it shows itself. There's communicable period to where your trans things can be transmitted from one person to another. These developments have been studied over time, and you just need to know that each disease has a different mode, period, and disease spectrum. Endemic, these are terms you want to memorize. Pandemic, epidemic, endemic would mean it's, it's known to be prevalent in that area. Epidemic is your, you think of it as a, your widespread outbreak. And pandemic means that it's covering the affects the majority of the of the world. And then surveillance is is so huge because a good surveillance system it systematically collects, like CDC, they have a system for collecting and organizing and analyzing current, accurate, and complete data. You want a good surveillance system. It is prevalent. You want to know the who, the when, the where. The what, these are elements that are used to answer the why. So everything is important, but surveillance is pivotal as far as when you have outbreaks or any type of infection that you're following. You need to respond, you need this information quickly so you can respond promptly and prevent outbreaks and epidemics and the like. And then you have emerging infectious diseases. And you may hear this term because that basically that usually, that usually means when you hear the disease is emerging, it's coming back. And we don't like emerging infectious diseases. We, don't, we want them to be taken care of, removed from the face of the planet, to never exist again. So emerging infectious diseases, those in which the incident, new cases, has actually increased in the past two decades or has the potential to increase in the near future. Emerging diseases makes us nervous. Ebola, West Nile, and now COVID. So when you're looking at your tables 11.2 and 11.1 in your chapters, just look there for your additional information and details. Make sure you always do your readings and so you have a good understanding. And then the factors that are influenced in these emerging infectious diseases are listed here for you. Human behavior is huge. What we're doing, what we're not doing, what, we're, what we can do. And that's where your primary prevention is pivotal. So your role in prevention is controlling, teaching, teaching, treating. Think of those three levels of prevention, primary, secondary, tertiary. It is applicable, certainly in this case. And so agents of bioterrorism, ever since, well, 911 put everything on the map with bioterrorism and, and the like and um, different things after the attack and the subsequent anthrax attack afterwards, just demonstrated that, hey, this can happen. We can have um, agents of bioterrorism and a possible threat to you, to US and globally intentionally. So just know that the CDC just suggests that the biological agents most likely to be employed in a bioterrorist attack are those that both have the potential for high mortality and can be easily disseminated, spread out with the rest results of major public panic. And they're listed here for you. Um, cognizant of. Vaccine preventable diseases have my entire heart and soul. I love me some vaccine preventable diseases listed here for you. Those well child visits, the immunizations that are recommended at certain ages and stages. Uh, to prevent, um, to reduce and prevent conditions from occurring are listed here for you. A bit about your food and waterborne diseases. 11.3 does a really good job for the five keys for safer food. Um, things tend to grow and ferment when they're left out on the counters. So you want to keep foods um, at the proper temperature, whether cold or hot. And there's that, there's that fine period of temperature in between where things like to grow. Um, so just be aware of that. 
And then your vector borne, your zoonosis, refers to illnesses that which the infectious agent is a carrier uh, transmitted by a, a vector, um, such as Lyme disease, rocket mine and spotted fever, um, faster or certain tick, rabies, and the by um, tick bites and methods to remove um, ticks is your prevention effort for your zoonosis is concerned. So, you know, if you travel outside of the country, travelers, diseases that are, um, that plague those outside of the United States, such as malaria and diarrheal diseases, talks about, you know, prevention from that effort is concerned. So therefore you wanna make sure that you know your you your water is clean, your food is cooked properly, and the like. Take it diseases and test tuninistic infections as well. That is also considered another form of um, infectious disease that can occur in the GI system. Acquired infections, infections, your HAI. During hospitalization stays that develop while you're in the hospital station setting, it can involve you as a nurse, a visitor, a patient, and just know that that's why we have universal precautions. And then there are other precautions for that a, a particular disease that you need to be aware of, such as um, as, as um, an airborne or what have you. Just know that we we definitely follow universal precautions precautions at all times. And then that ends our slide. And then we're just going to continue on because I believe we have chapter 12. We're just going to get right into this week to it. We're going to cover the natural history. We're going to talk a little bit about HIV, um, selective communicable diseases, your STIs, STDs, the behaviors that uh, put people at risk, and how we can, as nurses, reduce those risks. Again, having a solid knowledge about the risk for a communicable disease goes a long way as a nurse, a community health, public health nurse so that you can help your clients out in the community to reduce their risk and being affected from something that is preventable. And therefore, knowing that new diseases emerge, new treatments are oftentimes employed, and some diseases increase in the number of people affected and others show a decline. So we have a rise in some of those um, communicable diseases and a decline in other. So we're going to really go into the management um, prevention efforts, primary, secondary, and prevention, and what we can do to, to help our clients. So going into HIV, HIV was first reported in 81, and overall the rate of the diagnosis of HIV has um, decreased from 2014 and 2018. But the highest, it has been the highest rate of infections in those um, 25 to 29, and then followed by adults 20 to 24. So there's that's that population that you want to be aware of. It's become one of the world's greatest public health challenges. Um, the life care, lifetime cost is astronomical. And then there are different um, care acts in place and programs in place for individuals. That, are, that as a, a community health nurse, you want to be aware of the so unique link your folks to different resources. And so looking at the primary infection usually occurs within a month or of contracting the virus. There's a latency where there's no symptoms at all. And a final stage is where symptomatic uh, symptoms tend to show themselves. Transmission is from your blood, semen, vaginal secretions, breast milk. Rarely has it been through accidental needle stick, but it is a possibility. It is not transmitted through casual contact. Hopefully everyone knows that, dispels that myth there. So it's most often transmitted through sexual behavior and needle or syringe, I guess would be a close second. 
is disproportionately affects those minorities, um, male to male and transgender. But worldwide, there's been over 38 million, there are 38 million people living with this. So we wanna routinely voluntarily offer HIV testing. It is recommended for those individuals 13 to 64 at least once. And then for your high risk groups, you just, if you're working with a client and they are high risk and you know this because of what's listed in the previous slide, you just wanna make sure they get tested at least once a year. Uh, know what's recommended for, the, for, your, for your population so that you can offer that service to them. But it is, it is voluntary. And if you're in the community, you're caring for clients with, with AIDS, just know there are a plethora of resources that's available. Link them to that. Get them into um, the different programs to help them live the best possible life. And then moving on to the SPIs, the common ones that are listed here for you, the gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, the herpes, and human papilloma, just know what they are and that they are, they tend to be the most prevalent ones. And then hepatitis, it is, um, it's really the group that's going to be the one of the highest prevalence. So that existing cases are with those that are injected drug users. So with a, hepatitis, the groups with the highest prevalence of hepatitis tend to be those that are injected drug users. Persons with STDs, multiple sex partners, immigrants and refugees, and those descendants who came from areas where there is a high endemic rate of HPV, healthcare workers, clients on hemodialysis, inmates on long-term correctional, they tend to be the ones that are um, affected, tend to be high, more affected by hepatitis. And then um, TB is causing to be, it's, it's coming a, a reemergence of multi-drug resistant TB. And that becomes a, a concern because it's pro prompted the use of uh, direct observed therapy where you ob ob observe your patient taking the therapy um, however often is needed to make sure they're not skipping any pills, they're not missing any doses. You actually go there however it's ordered and you may, you watch them take that medication or that treatment so that that has been the number one issue with multi-drug resistance is lack of complying with the, um, the, the, the care plan, the plan of care as far as medications are concerned. So you wanna improve screening, you wanna improve treatment strategies, and DOT is a great way of, of doing that when you actually watch someone take their medication. So as a nurse's role, we are educators. If we're, again, if we're nothing else, we educate, educate, educate. We advocate for our patients, we case manage those, following up with them by phone or in person. We get them to their primary care provider. We help them get connected with community resources. We always follow our standard precautions in place. And that concludes your chapter 11. And I believe our last one is chapter 27. I wanted to stay in order for us. Finding my chapter, chapter 12, chapter 5. Let me get to T7. Where are you? 12, 11, 5. You guys, excuse me for one moment while I find my chapter. Great job staying focused here. Let's get into violence and human abuse. Objectives that we're going to cover today, and we are off. Violence is a it's a public health concern. It's social, 
and it's a developmental threat. And we we have to be aware of the potential that we might face out in the community. The leading, leading cause of death and disability amongst our youth are low income, are people of color. So nurses are uniquely qualified to help those in the community to um, mitigate and its consequences and to be there for our patients. So we're gonna examine public health, this violence is a public health problem and it is, it is identified as a public health concern and to be aware of it and what nurses can do to, um, to help those in need. Community violence, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, collective, collectively called interpersonal violence and suicide are the most and severe forms of violence. And so community violence refers to violence that occurs between strangers, friends, acquaintances, and it is physically and it typically takes place outside of someone's home. Uh, there involves usually this fighting or assault, there's firearms. Intimate partner violence includes physical, sexual, or psychological harm, including stalking caused by a current or former partner or spouse. Well, sexual violence refers to sexual activity when consent is not obtained and is not freely given. And suicide, in contrast, is self-directed harm. And so in our chapter 27.1 in figure one, for there's a model there I want you guys to just make sure you're aware of. There's a step-by-step -step approach that is um, applicable to any community where there's identifying the problem, you identify the risk, you develop strategies and share information with others, and you disseminate, you spread that information for the strategies in step three. So as far as social and community factors that are influencing violence, Individual is that the first level identifies a biological, as far as CDC's four level socio-ecological model, individual relationship, community, societal. Individual is that first level identifies a biological and personal history factors that may increase the likelihood of a person becoming a victim. In addition to the risk factors above, others include education, substance use, a history of abuse, Witnessing abuse and mental health can affect that individual um, and be factors to influence, unfortunately, violence. Relationship, the second level of the model, it just looks at close societal relationships, such as with peers, intimate partners, families, um, family members may increase someone's uh, risk for violence, victimization, like the risk for violence is increased in a woman and one or more, who, with, and one or more children when they live with an abuser. Also, adolescents are more likely to gauge in violence behavior when their peers accept this behavior as being okay. Then on your community level, it refers to settings like schools and workplaces and neighborhoods. It's important to consider a low level of cohesiveness and affiliation with neighbors, high population density, all of those things can put someone at risk for violence. Um, and then factors that increases people's and communities' resilience is when they have those coordinated services in place. They have access to mental and substance abuse and treatment to get the support and care that they need. So as mentioned in the community, it is important to fully understand risk factors, what puts someone at risk, and is the workplace that one tolerates, do they tolerate verbal abuse? Can I look at the workplace? School, schools, are they dealing with bullying? How do they deal with bullying? So these are things that you want to know um, as a population or is, what's the, is there high unemployment that can stress folks out? Are there jobs that are available? Or how do you socialize and interact? To what extent do they do you find their peer groups in a gang rather than at sports? So you gotta look at all of that when you're assessing your community for violence. Homicide, these are definitions, just know them. Homicide, assault, sexual violence, human trafficking, and suicide. This is a violence against individuals or oneself. Homicide is killing of one human being by another. Assault, when you attack someone verbally or physically. Sexual assault, again, someone is taking part in a sexual act without their consent. Think rape, human trafficking, Recruiting, harboring, transporting, or providing an individual for service 
or commercial sex acts through the use of force and deception and coercion. And suicide is the act of taking one's own life. So family violence and abuse, there's a development of abuse patterns noticed in families that are, so, that are affected by abuse in their home, such as child abuse. There's indicators that you wanna look for um, that are talked about in, in your chapter. Neglect is a form of abuse, sexual abuse, intimate partner violence, abuse on older adults. So you wanna know those strategies in box 27.2, um, figure 27.5, you just want to get to know those as well. You want to assess during your routine examination. Violence is something you should be taking a look for, and it talks about how to do that. Marital discord, counseling for at-risk, teaching, that's our primary. Assisting with controlling anger, that's our secondary. Treatment for substance abuse, that means they have an issue, that's tertiary stress reduction strategies, and the like. And you guys, that it concludes our week seven concept. You have to do the reading. When you look at the objectives, read your objectives first. Make sure that by the time you're done with reviewing your chapters, go back and look at look those objectives, skim through them, have a look and say, you know what, I, I get this concept. And if not, read it again. And if not, read it again. We'll talk about it in class. We'll have some more time to interact with the chapters. We'll cover week six and week seven. And that concludes our week seven concept. I'm Professor Jennifer Harrison-Howard signing off. You guys have an amazing evening. Thank you.